Welcome to the New Testament Review, where every episode we discuss an influential work of New Testament scholarship. I'm Laura Robinson. I'm Ian Mills. And we are PhD candidates at Duke University. Today we're discussing Carolyn Oziek's The Family in Early Christianity, Family Values Revisited, published in 1996. Laura, what's this article about? This article is about the role of the family in the New Testament and what the New Testament has to say about the family and how it works. And this is a really interesting question that was clearly at the at the front of a lot of uh, Bible scholars' minds in the 1990s. We did a little engram search of the frequency with which uh, the phrase family values was used in literature, and there's a huge spike around 1996-97 where you have sort of the latter stage Clinton presidency and the rise of and the rise of the moral majority. So this is a look back at the New Testament to see what it actually does say about families. And the big takeaway from this article is that the family is very different in the New Testament than it is today. Yep, Oziek is explicitly responding to the increasingly widespread appeal to quote unquote biblical families or family values. And she's saying, okay, what actually did the early church, does the New Testament say about families? And also, what assumptions do we have when we look at the New Testament and look for material about families? There's tension between our definition of a family and the ancient understanding of what a family is and how families should operate. But there's also this fundamental tension in the New Testament about whether or not a family even really matters all that much. There's basically two blocks of literature in the New Testament that discuss the family, some of which are very uh, establishmentarian and treat the family as this sort of uh, stable, conservative institution. And there's other texts that are actually very anti-family and really destabilize or criticize this model. You might remember from our Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza episode, where we talked particularly about the role of women and how Paul and Jesus' liberative statements about women in the early church, in the early Jesus movement, were, by their very nature of being liberative, were anti-family. And we discussed in the latter part of that episode how these played out in the Roman world, that Christians were known as people who broke up families, and particularly who more or less stole wives from their husbands, (laughs) because they were persuading women to leave the paterfamilias to abandon sexual activity um, and to commit their lives to Jesus. Um, And so lots of early martyrdom accounts and other discussions of why Christians were problematic feature Christians breaking up traditional Roman families. Uh, So let's look at a few of those passages from the Gospels and from Paul that supported this wing or this trajectory in early Christianity. Whoever comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Another verse, and everyone who has left houses, or brothers and sisters, or father or mother, or children or fields, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. Someone told him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, wanting to speak to you. But to the one who had told him this, Jesus said, Who is my mother, and who are my brothers? I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. So, we have Gospels, we have Paul, both saying some pretty negative things about families, about your spouses, about your parents, and even promising rewards if you leave your children. (laughs) (laughs) We should also note that the neither slave nor free, uh, that might not sound anti-family to us because our families nowadays don't contain slaves, but 2,000 years ago, slaves within the family would have been ubiquitous and would have been considered part of the household. Yeah. It would have been considered very anti-family to say that you uh, that there are no slaves in this house. Then what what are these people living in your home then? <laughs> right. So. Yeah. We'll we'll get to the definition of family here in a bit. Yeah. But on the other hand, we have these very anti-family statements, but we also have these very pro-family statements. So let's run through some of these. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Wives, in the same way, submit 
yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see their purity and reverence of your lives. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. We could add to this, of course, the Ephesians and Colossian household codes. We could add the pastoral statements about wives submitting to their husbands. We could add Jesus' statement about how the bride and bridegroom leave their parents to unite with each other. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you've got statements that are relatively affirming of families, even reinstating, reinscribing traditional norms like enslaved people fearing their masters. And you mm -hmm. also have the more radical side of things telling people that slavery doesn't exist in Christ. Yeah. So what are we dealing with here? What are we actually talking about when we talk about the ancient family? It's worth noting that in the Greco-Roman world, in none of these languages we're talking about, is there a word for the nuclear family? So what we think of as a family, mom, dad, kids, there's no word for that in the ancient world because that's not what a family was to them. Uh, they did have a word for the familia, which is under the power of the pater familias, the male head of the household, or in the male line of succession. In this this would include your slaves, it would include the renters who work in your house, it might include your unmarried relatives, uh, there's always a possibility you might own a home with some of your siblings, um, but there's also this flexibility between commercial space and uh, domestic space, so if you live in a house and you have people renting the front of your house for a shop and a living space, then those guys might be your family too. It's not really mom, dad, and kids, it's... Dad, slaves, renters, siblings. It's worth noting, furthermore, that in our time period, something called a sinemanu marriages were increasingly common, in which the wife, the mother of the family, wasn't part of the family. So if you went back and selected any random family in the second century Rome, the mother would not have been part of that family, but the slaves, renters, and certain free employees would have been. So this clearly doesn't, like, correspond neatly to our conception of family. Not only does the ancient world have a very different understanding of what a family is, but they also have a really different understanding of what it means to have a house, and particularly what it means to eat with your family. This matters because church services revolve so much around food. So homes in the ancient world aren't terribly private. You know, when we think about houses, we think about a structure uh, with some property around it and, you know, people have to have your permission to come into it. Especially vampires. <laughs> exactly. You're a vampire, you particularly have to be asked in. Uh, but the ancient world, uh, they had a serious vampire problem. They had, th the homes would have these large sort of semi-public, semi-private spaces around them. Uh, you would have your atrium out front, your vestibules. Uh, these are relatively public access places places where people could basically come on up and hang out with you if they wanted to. It's also worth noting that household dining is really different from the way we do it, and this matters because we know that early Christian churches met in households and they tended to organize around eating meals together. Dining parties, formal meals, would have been the reserve of wealthy people. It seems that based on what we know about how most other houses worked and what we know about the Roman population, most people who weren't wealthy just ate out. Uh, they might, might grill over a brazier or something, or they would eat from food stalls that were sort of public. In contrast, we know it was a major social event for wealthy families to host meals. There's been a lot of recent work on how these were often reading events as well. These were places where people would share their new compositions or share new books they'd discovered. Um, so these were major, major social events. But a triclinium, the dining room, uh, the Roman dining room, only seated about nine people. And so if you are hosting a dinner party, your, your guests are going to spill over into other rooms of the house. They would very likely spill over outside of the triclinium into other spaces. And there are several consequences of this. One is that this would 
create a sort of natural hierarchy. If you have a center room where everyone gets nice, nice couches, which are the technical places where people expect traditionally to eat supper, whoever gets those spaces is going to be some sort of privilege. A lot of places where you would be sitting at a dining party, if you weren't in the triclinium itself, uh, these places weren't necessarily terribly private. The home of a well-off family in Rome would have these places on the outside, the atrium and the vestibule, that were sort of semi-public places, and it was okay if people who didn't live in that house came onto it. And there would be people eating in these spaces at a dinner party. So one thing we do know is that it would sometimes happen if you were having a dinner party, your less privileged guests were sitting outside, that they would just be joined by people outside. We have records of people complaining about strangers just joining their dinner parties uh, that they're hosting at their households. People just come off the street and go into these public places in the house and eat there. So I think this helps us understand what's going on in 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul envisions random strangers wandering in on church services where people are practicing glossolalia, where people are practicing ec ecstatic speech. If you are imagining someone in a private room, private house, uh, holding a, a secretive church service, it's kind of hard to fathom what Paul is describing here. It's kind of hard to fathom a random stranger walking into a modern day bedroom, right? Or a modern day house. But if you recognize that to most people, this church service would probably have looked just like a normal formal meal in, with reading and entertainment included, then it's totally understandable to see how random people off the street might have wandered into a church service. Not all churches would have met in actual houses. They also could have met in apartment buildings. And apartment buildings in the ancient world are not like our apartment buildings. A lot of times they'll have entrances to one another through through the other apartments. So these tend to be semi-public places where people can basically come in if they want to. For instance, in the Acts of Justin, Justin says that he has been hosting his meetings above these certain baths in Rome. And there's a really great article on this by H.G. Snyder showing how this portrayal of Justin as a teacher holding sort of semi-public meetings in an apartment above these local baths showing how that situates Justin as a sort of teacher who is trying to attract students, building up the sort of reading group in Rome. And w one of the things that's interesting in contrast to the house church model is this is the sort of thing where you don't expect entire families to convert and you don't expect, you don't have the triclinium mm -hmm. set, like setting in a definite institutional hierarchy for more or less honored members of this group. This is a sort of a different model of what a, a read, Christian group meeting would have looked like. And it's easy to see how these different situations might have set up different kinds of hierarchies or enforced hierarchies in different ways. So as we can see, there's some major differences between what a household is, what a family is, what it means to meet in a household. All those things are really different 2000 years ago from what they would have been like now. So is the New Testament pro-family or anti-family? And the thing that Osiak wants to point out is there are some real pressures on both sides here. There are many situations in which early Christian meetings and early Christian communities could be really anti-family without necessarily trying hard to be, without necessarily preaching against the family. There's an inherent conflict between the demands that churches made on their individual members and the demands that those members' families would have made on them. When we look at Tertullian, we see oftentimes he's not really preaching against the family. He's not preaching this sort of radical anti-family message. He's just seeing the inherent conflict between the demands that a woman's household would have made on her if she was married to a non-Christian and the demands that the church makes. So he discourages women from marrying non-Christian men, not because women shouldn't be getting married, period, even though he does say this in other places, but because a household will uh, have things like dinners planned and meetings planned. And if you also are a member of the society that has regular fasts and regular meetings and regular um, 
group acts of charity, there's going to be a real time commitment issue there. So honestly, there's just this inherent tension between the church and the family, the way there is with the family in any basically time-consuming hobby. It's also worth noting how participation in a social group like the church, where people are supporting each other financially and in other ways, how that would have undermined client, traditional client-patron relationships, where wealthy people expected to have followings of poorer people who they would do favors for, who they would give money to, who they would support in various ways in exchange for some sort of fidelity from the clients. If you have a church group where you are sharing meals, where you are sharing spaces, where you are funding each other's funerals and things like that, you have less and less of a need for these patron-client relationships. Or more likely, actually, says Oziak, is that relationship, the patron-client relationship, gets sort of transferred over to the bishop. And there's been interesting work done on this by Peter Brown and stuff like that. How the bishop sort of becomes a different kind of patron, delegating, controlling resources in a different way in support of his clients. The church also has a really complicated relationship with patriarchy. It seems like early, early Christian movements, um, like the Jesus movement and the charismatic movement that seems to have emerged in some Pauline churches, did undermine patriarchy in a lot of ways. You have female prophets, you have female teachers, uh, you have female disciples of Jesus who are uh, doing a lot of the provision for the church. Ultimately, the church does come to reinscribe and reinforce patriarchy in its more institutional forms of uh, leadership, you know, church elders and bishops by the time the pastoral epistles roll around. It, it is a male-dominated institution. At the end of this article, Oziak proposes a theory and then kind of undermines it. And her theory is that the establishment, traditional household codes we find in Ephesians and Colossians and 1 Peter are the consequence of or are correlated with early Christian communities that are constituted by entire family conversions and meet in households. And those two things are obviously correlated. Um, if you have a familias who converts and his entire household comes with him, that is more likely going to be the situation in which you are using a house to meet in. In contrast, she suggests that the anti-family, the anti-traditional roles, the more liberative veins we find in early Christian literature probably come from contexts where there are individuals within families who are, have converted, who have joined the Jesus movement and are experiencing conflict with their parents, with their spouses, with their enslavers. And you can see how she suggests, you can see how this rhetoric of hating your father, hating your mother, leaving your children, leaving your spouses, um, how that being a good thing could grow out of a situation in which your family doesn't support your membership in the Jesus movement. The The big spoiler for this, though, is First Peter, uh, which Osik points out. First Peter is a very patriarchal and uh, pro-slavery text. It encourages submission to bad husbands and submission to bad uh, to bad enslavers. And it's also worth noting that these texts usually assume that the wife or the enslaved person is the converted member of the household, probably the only one. So these do seem to be situations in which individuals have converted to Christianity. The rest of the household has not. But the text is still very, um, very reinforcing and reinscribing of patriarchal norms. The underlying logic seems to be very strongly associated with the idea that submitting to bad behavior is worthwhile missionary activity. So you have these sort of like pro-family, uh, pro-conservative family structure uh, statements in the text. Uh, it's done with very, um, like there, there's a motivator behind it, the idea that this is useful for expanding the church. So it really does take these family institutions and manipulate them for the for the sake of the church. Uh, the the resulting ethic is quite traditional and quite conservative, but the the ends aren't necessarily. So where Oziak comes down is that this model may have some explanatory power, but is is too neat. There are some spoilers for it. More likely, she suggests, the traditional family pro-family, pro-institutional, pro-hierarchy, pro-patriarchy, pro-slavery passages are examples of the early Christian movement sort of accommodating to 
the social norms, accommodating to the rest of society. So we have an early Christian sort of radical movement that is gradually assimilating itself to social norms as a way to, you know, survive in society. You also don't really have a family that's being abolished as much as it is being extended. There's still a lot of interest in how Christians are going to exist in their current family structures, but also you have the church taking on the role of the family and uh, creating family-like relationships between people who d d who previously didn't have them. This is sort of the fictive kinship idea, right? The, the uh, material, uh, financial, social support that a person would normally expect from their family unit uh, is now coming from the church. Early Christians didn't get rid of the family. They said you should treat everyone like your family, <laughs> or at least you should treat all believers like your family, depending on which passage you're looking at there. Uh, so she describes this as the church actually becoming a miniature welfare state. And I think once again, you can hear uh, the 1996 mm -hmm. political context coming through here. So my working theory on how this all breaks down, which I advocated in our Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza episode, is that a sort of early radicalism gradually accommodates itself to social norms. And there are some people who are, you know, conservative within Christianity who preserve that radicalism. There are the, there are the people who go into the second and third century who continue to follow the radical interpretation of Paul and Jesus's teachings, while other people are gradually conforming themselves to the sort of patriarchal structures of society. And, you know, that, that might be right. That does seem to be where Oziak comes down. But I've wondered if maybe there's a role here for the historical Jesus to have some explanatory power. Where, is it possible that a, a first century Jew, an apocalyptic prophet in Palestine, taught that the world was about to end, and that had radical consequences for how you relate to family and societal structures, and that is getting preserved over into our earliest Christian texts that are also trying to set up institutions at the same time. And I'm not sure these are really competing theories. These may be two ways of t saying the same thing. I've wondered if reading these things as just lenses for what the group or the community was doing all the time is missing out on the component that the historical Jesus did play in forming the Jesus traditions that get preserved in our Gospels. Yeah. Now, when we look at Jesus, we we do see a person whose family seems to be in considerable disarray, that there's a fair amount of conflict between Jesus and his brothers and eventually his mother. But with this, this radical vision and this understanding that following Jesus creates conflict with the family um, or even diminishes the importance of the family altogether, this is something that shows up throughout Christian history. It does It, it never completely goes away. Uh, but it's not with it's not well represented in these extremely institutional models of what Christianity is. Yeah, family values in the New Testament. So that's the family. It's complicated, which makes for a funny occasion to announce that Jody and I, my wife and I, are having our first child. <laughs> I don't plan to practice Mark's exhortation to abandon our children, uh, at least not at this point. <laughs> Hearty congratulations for everybody. Well, this should be a fruitful text for discussing in our after party tonight. I'm really excited about this after party. I think this will be a lot of fun. Come talk to us about family conflicts, about ancient slavery, about marriage, and about the way this has been appropriated in 1980s, 90s, 2000s political discourse tonight on YouTube. Bring your questions, bring your comments, bring your arguments. We'd love to hear them. It's gonna be fun. See you there. Yep. See you, Laura. Take care. Bye. Oh, run further to the dark. Oh.